Good morning. This is the Ministers in Training class, September the 18th. And it's the first class of the fall session for 2021. We're covering in this section about prayer and about giants will fall. And that we are praying from a foundation in Christ Jesus. And that foundation is solid. And that foundation is sure. And it's in Christ Jesus. And giants will fall. Okay? And the giants, of course, we're coming against is spiritual giants in high places. Jesus came for what purpose? And who is Jesus? Jesus is the one who has the salvation that we have in God, not the things of the world. The COVID shot is not our salvation. The doctor's office is not our salvation. The uh, government is not our salvation. And uh, the local food store is not our salvation or whatever that may be going on is not our salvation. But our salvation is God in Christ Jesus. 1 John 3, 8 says what happens and what really goes on. The person that commits sin is of the devil, and the devil sins from the beginning, and sin was around since the beginning. For this purpose is the Son of God manifested, or made known, which is Jesus. For this purpose was Jesus made known, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And he did. A lot of people in the times past have said, uh, Jesus came preaching okay, and teaching, and then they'd say, well, what did he preach and teach? Well, he preached love and acceptance. And I'll agree with him on half of that, which is Jesus came teaching love. But love and acceptance, no. Now, he, he came teaching and operating in the Spirit of God. So what did he do? It says in the gospel, in the book uh, uh, of the good news, the good news of the salvation in Christ Jesus, the Bible, it says that Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and healing all manners of sicknesses and diseases. So he did come preaching and teaching and healing and delivering and setting people free from the bondages that they were in. And who is the bondage giver? Satan is the bondage giver. Satan is the one who has people in bondage and in fear, in sickness, in disease, and in traps, and in his traps. And we don't want to stay in his traps, but we want to stay in a position and a place in Christ Jesus that we have strength. We want to stay in the ark. And so Jesus came and destroyed the works of the devil. Well, what is the principle that he was doing teaching? The principle of what he was doing is in Mark chapter 4. And in Mark chapter 4, it talks about the principle of sowing seed time and harvest. Everything in the world, everything in this earth works on seed time and harvest. Seeds planted, a harvest is made, then people eat, and seed is planted, and seasons come and go, and that sort of thing. And so what does it say about the seed time and harvest? It says that uh, when Jesus was about preaching and teaching and healing, he was sowing seeds. He was sowing seeds of the kingdom of God. And so, so is the kingdom of God as if a person should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed would spring up and grow. And he doesn't necessarily have to understand how it comes up and grows and does this and that. And so, but it does. The earth brings forth, or the heart, the believing, the believing heart, brings forth fruit of itself. First the blade, then the ear, and after that the full corn of the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately the harvester puts in the sickle and harvest, and harvest is the seed or the fruit of the ground or the fruit of whatever it may be. The same thing that we should do then. We sow the seeds of the Word of God. Jesus said he is the bread of life. And how do you get bread? You take seeds and you grind it and you mix it and you process it. And the bread comes out. And well, Jesus is the bread of life. And so therefore, how is this done? How is this brought forth? He puts in the sickle and the harvest is made. And Jesus said, whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or what comparison it? It's like a grain of mustard seed that's sown in the earth. So we sow seed in the earth. 
we sow seed into the people's hearts. The earth is, is an example of people's hearts, and we sow seed into people's lives as ministers, and then that seed is brought forth, and that harvest is brought forth. And we said, take here, this is why it says, take heed what you hear, what you hear with your ears and what you see with your eyes. And these days, what are you hearing with your ears and what are you seeing with your eyes? If you're watching the regular media, then the media that's going on right now is a position and a place of bondage. Why? Because it puts a person in fear. It arrests a person and puts them in a fear and it puts them in a place of life, life-threatening position, you might say, or it drives them. The world situations wants to drive people. Satan through situations and circumstances wants to drive people and drive them to a certain place and to a certain position and get them into bondage and get them into fear and get them into subjection unto him. If you're in bondage to fear, to a sickness or to a disease, uh, to a life-threatening situation in your own life, to poverty, uh, no money or whatever it may be, you're in those bondage places, you will do whatever it takes to get out of it. And a lot of times... Uh, Satan has a plan and a way for you to looks like get out of it, but it's really not a place and a position you want to go. So how did God do this? Through Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And it was a physical uh, process, but yet a spiritual reality. And the spiritual reality was that Satan in his domain and, and dominion was beaten and Jesus took over. So what did Jesus teach? Let's look at nine, uh, Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 17, okay? Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 17. And again, we are the ones who pray and come against giants and come against those that would come against us in the world, okay? And so Luke 9, 1 through 17. It says that, Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure all diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick and to deliver. And he said unto them, Don't take anything with you, uh, neither bread, neither money, nor script, whatever it may be, whatever house you go into. Therefore, receive what they give you, and whatever will not you, you know, that you can't receive, shake the dust off your feet. And they departed and went. And they did all the things that they needed to do. But how did it all end up? It all ended up that they, through Jesus and through the name of Jesus, had power and authority in his name. And when the apostles returned from where they had went, they told all that they had done. And then Jesus took them aside privately to a desert place belonging to a place called Bethesda. And the people, when they knew it, followed him and Jesus had to keep preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God and healing those that needed healing. But the twelve wanted to talk to Jesus. And so they came to Jesus and said, send the multitude away and let them find lodging and places to go. And, and uh, then Jesus said to them, though, these are hungry. These need uh, food or whatever. These need to be fed. He said, give them to eat. And they said, but we don't have anything. You even told us to go uh, out and preach ourselves without picking up anything and taking money and taking bread and all that. But he said unto them, make them sit down. Then he took for the five loaves and two fishes that they said they had had. You are familiar with the parable. And he blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples to give to the multitude. So Jesus told them a spiritual thing for them to do. He said, you feed them. You preach to them. You preach deliverance. You preach the kingdom of God. You do those things because I am the bread of life. And if I'm the bread of life, then those things uh, that they need to eat are in the word of God and, and by the word of God. But yet he took the physical representation of the bread of life, broke it himself, and was feeding. And then the fish a representation of the Spirit and the Word of God and the Word of God and told him to give it to him. And so the disciples found an example then or were given an example 
of that if you said, you know, send them away, and Jesus said, you feed them, and they said, well, in a way, we don't have anything to feed them. And he said, yes, you do. And he showed them how to feed them. Because they knew about what Jesus had taught and about the kingdom of God. And he wanted to show them how they can distribute food as the bread of life, giving out the bread and ministering to them. So they learned uh, a lesson by doing it physically. So if you volunteer at a soup kitchen, <laughs> praise the Lord, or volunteer at a place to... Uh, feed people who don't have anything, or you take stuff, take food and provision to one another, that's you giving physical representation and making intercession for the people that you're helping out, for your brethren that you're helping out, for your clan that you're helping out. Well, the same thing here. You also give them the word of God. Write some scripture down for them and say, pray and intercede and I'll agree with you. Find your point Find your point of faith, that you would have faith for something. A lot of people have a big thing come against them. Big sickness and disease, or a uh, car accident, or maybe they're locked in the house and they can't get any food because they are not supposed to get out and stuff like that. Pray and intercede for one another and ask what you can do for one another. And if the Lord tells you to do something, then you have a point of faith. You have a place where God's told you to do something, and you can go help a person. And it's your neighbor. It's people close to you. You don't have to worry about going far off, going into town and helping somebody do something like that, unless you're picking up stuff to bring back out. Help the one in front of you. Help the one behind you. Help the one beside you. Help those around you. And you'll be doing the work of God. And you'll be coming against the giants. People have giants coming against them. Again, the sickness and disease, the COVID, the, uh, the you know, separation and the anxiety feelings and the pressure of work uh, always entangling them up. Turn that to God. Uh, ask God for that revelation of what you are to do in that situation, that circumstance, and to find out how you are to help. Uh, an example is be Philippians chapter 4, 6 and 7, verses 6 and 7. Cast in your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. And he is the one who gives you rest. Not as the world gives you rest, uh, John chapter 14. But as he gives the people rest. Not as the world gives the rest, but as he gives people rest. And remember, he's the bread of life. He is the foundation. Jesus is our foundation. Jesus is our rest. Jesus is our healing. Jesus is our wholeness. The blood of Jesus is our deliverer. If you feel a fever coming on you, maybe just a cold, but if you feel a fever coming on you, plead the blood of Jesus. If you feel a uh, pain in your back uh, or a headache that's really bad coming on you, plead the blood of Jesus. Plead the blood of Jesus for that deliverance and that life because Jesus is the one who is our healer and our wholeness. And he then can get us help. If we need a doctor, fine. We'll find that place of acceptance and find that place of a doctor. Because doctors are here for our help. They're not here for our hurt. And that's a confession of faith these days. Because you don't know these days sometimes. Okay? Our mission statement for the ministers and training is in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. What are we to do? We as ministers... And for those around us, those that are feeling bad, having a bad time, not knowing what to do, not knowing where to get help and do that sort of thing, we are to sow the seed of the word of God out. Why? Because here's our commission, right? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 uh, through 12. And it's quite long, but it, wherefore, it says, Wherefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, we walk worthy of the vocation wherein you're called. You're called as a minister, and we'll see that here in a minute. With lowliness, with meekness, with long-suffering, we forbear one another, our friends and our neighbors. We forbear one another in love. We endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the peace and the bond of peace, for there is one body and one Spirit, even as we are called in the one hope of our calling. There is one church. There is not Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic, and all those that are born again. There is one church. And we need to operate and work in unity to pull the large giants down, the large giants of 
the misinformation in the media, the misinformation with the government, and the, the disinformation with the medical field that's going on right now, those giants have to be pulled down, but they have to be pulled down by us joining together, being in unity in the church, not in separation in the church. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in us all. And then to every one of us is giving grace according to the measure of Christ. We have the grace of God. We can receive the grace of God and go through, not get stuck in the middle, but go through what God wants us to go through. Wherefore, he said, Jesus ascended on high, led captivity captive, overcome, overcame Satan, gave gifts unto people. Okay? He gave some apostles, the prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers, and pastors. That's who we are. And what are we there for? We are there for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect person, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We are one in Christ Jesus, and we operate as one in Christ Jesus. But he descended on high and gave gifts to everyone. Now, we solidify that through the knowledge of the Word of God, through the knowledge of the faith in the Word of God, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. We come up to points of faith. What do you believe? What do you receive? Do you believe in the creation of God? The very largest deception that has been going on for 200 years in the world is from the first five words of the Bible. Go to the Old Testament, go to the book of Genesis and read the first five words. What does it say? In the beginning God. That's four. Created. Created. Natural selection and evolution was made up by people who hate God, who do not want to be under the thumb of God, and who do not want to follow the principles of the kingdom of God. So they made up their own. They said, we came from nothing. We came from nothing. Right. Nothing to something. There was nothing but dirt and heat and oil and whatever there may be, water, hot water, uh, just salt. Think about it and put it all together and hit it with lightning real hard. Hit it with lightning. Hit it with lightning. How many times before a one cell thing comes about? Well, one cell takes 21 parts. One simple cell takes 21 parts of exactly the right proteins, the right, the right carbon, the, right, the sac to hold it all together, and all of that to even make a blob. And that one blob, maybe even if I tell you it can reproduce, that's what makes a living thing. The definition of a living thing is it can reproduce. Okay. So it reproduces. So there's big blobs. So there's big slime all over the world. So what if there's a big slime all over the world? Who told that slime what to do? Who told that slime what to become? And so in our class yesterday, we talked about somebody. If you went to a desert island or the top of the highest mountain that nobody's ever been to, maybe an island that nobody's ever been to, a deserted island, not necessarily desert, but you see flowers, you see birds, and you see bugs, and you see all kinds of things on this island then all of a sudden there is a water bottle that says Niagara on it, or another word, a water bottle that says Niagara. What's your first word and what's your only word that you have to say? Somebody. Somebody has been here. Somebody has been here. Why? You recognize design. You recognize creation. But yet you can look at that bird, you can look at that flower, you can look at all the bugs, and you don't recognize design. You don't recognize creation. Well, you should. Why? Because that bottle that says Niagara on it is just a piece of plastic on a piece of paper. No DNA, no RNA, no coding. There had to be codes, interlocking codes. You know how they go up. Codes... For those words, there's a word spelled there. Well, that's one word. The code in a flower is a dictionary that's this thick. The code, just pages. Say there's 2,000 pages in that dictionary that thick. That's how much code it takes to tell that flower to be what it is to be and then to have seed and reproduce 
and to have leaves and fallow and, and seed and pollen and all of that and to look beautiful and yellow and whatever it may be instead of just a gray flower. Code. Who told it? Who told that slime to make a flower? Who told that slime to make a fish? Who told that? Nobody. Somebody had to code it. And uh, my greatest example that I like is you go to Best Buy, you get the most expensive computer, tabletop computer with a box and a screen, and you put it all together, and you get a keyboard, and you get a mouse, uh, whatever it may be. You know all the stuff you need for a computer, and you plug it in. And maybe I'll even let you tie in hardwire to a Cray computer. And you do all that. How long will it take that computer to produce a dictionary? you know, maybe a dictionary of RNA for that flower or something else. It never will. Oh, I ain't going to do nothing. Even if I give you electricity and it's on and it's just sitting there. Why? Because there's no software in it. There is nothing that tells that computer what to do. Well, this is the same thing even if you had a single cell that was alive and maybe could even reproduce itself and become a bunch of slime. There's nothing there to tell it what to do. Who told that to make a person? Who told that slime to make a person? Who told that slime to make a fish? Who told that slime to make a bird? Come up with that and then we'll talk about the difference between creation and natural selection. Natural selection, which means if you believe in natural selection, you can teach in any college in the world. But if you don't, you can't. Right? Amen. So, you talk about deception. There is deep deception in the world right now. And the deception tools, uh, one of the big deception tools is media. Years ago, it used to be just the newspaper. Uh, Hearst, back in his day, thought he could control the world by what he printed in his newspaper from New York. Watch the old movie uh, Newsboys and uh, Newsies and see what you think about that movie. He talks about it. Hey, I can control the whole world. I can herd the people any way I want to go by what I produce and tell in my newspaper. Well, what do you think they can do with pictures on TV now? Pictures of what our kids have seen. And our, seen, our kids have seen plenty. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Even the phones that we got now, um, they're glued to them because there's pictures and supposedly news and friends and all this stuff on there. And they're glued to it. And uh, they can't seem to get away from it because... Uh, it produces a chemical, and it's an addiction chemical called dopamine. And that addiction chemical works on a lot of other things and areas too. But anyway, Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the foundation of life. And he said that we could overcome giants. We could overcome mountains. And so where do we overcome mountains? We overcome mountains by believing and receiving. Who are we? Who are we in God and in Christ Jesus? Look up who you are. Uh, one of the things I wrote down just the other day is that uh, we have a Bethel. We are a Jerusalem and we do a Hebron. And it's from the, the book here about the giants will fall. Okay, we have a Bethel. We are the house of God. We are the house of God. We are a Jerusalem. We are a city of peace and wholeness. Wholeness. Remember the word wholeness healthy, healed, whole. And we do Hebrons, and which means we overcome. We are overcomers. We have friendships, we have leagues, we have relatives, we have relationships, we have harbors, and we have refuges. Hebron is the place of alliances and leagues and friendships and refuges. Refuge, not refugees, but refuges. And we come into those places of refuge. Why do they want the church closed? Why do they want them out in cars and where people can't get in? How do you evangelize in a car type situation? You don't. Not easily. If the, if the world and the Satan and the world can close the churches, then the evangelization supposedly goes down. But guess what? Mario Morello uh, is in New York or going to New York real soon. And Mario is having all kinds of revival and miracles in California and in New York, the hard places. I know, he could have it in Texas. <laughs> Texas, Arizona, Florida, amen, the places that are open. But he's going to New York, and he has the pastors joining together. We join together. We join together in leagues. We become Hebrons. 
we join together in leagues and when we join together in leagues we can overcome and overcome and be overcome those giants that are coming against us how are we going to overcome the giants on the reservation by joining together by leaguing our churches together by leaguing our prayer together by leaguing our belief together our point of faith there are points of faith and what do i mean by points of faith if you're a real hardliner about believing and receiving and that's the only way it comes you may have a I gave you yesterday an example of a hip problem. You may have a hip problem, and you start believing God. Believe God, I believe Jesus bore my sickness and diseases and infirmities. He bore my infirmities, which is this hip problem. And you keep believing and keep believing and keep believing. Well, it keeps kind of defeating you and keeps kind of defeating you. Yet a doctor says, I can go in there and trim that off or straighten that up uh, with a little surgery, and you'll be, you'll be good, Okay. And you'll say, but I don't believe in doctors. All right, well, start believing in doctors and start believing in people to help. Start believing in leagues to help. So how would we do it? Here's how we do it. Same as a, same as a, a uh, splinter in your finger. Say you had a splinter in your finger. Okay, would you call a doctor for a splinter in the finger that you couldn't get out? No, what do you do? You get a needle, sewing needle, whatever it may be. Get a little alcohol. Pour alcohol on it, get that sewing needle, dig that splinter out, throw it away, put some neosporin on it, maybe put a Band-Aid on it, and you're good and you're gone. Well, why didn't you believe for that splinter to just disappear? Because you knew and seen how to do it. You had a point of faith. Hey, my point of faith is I can dig that out and I'll be healed and I'll be whole and it's good. Well, same thing with the hip. You may go to a doctor and he says, I can do this, I can do that, and you get into agreement with that doctor and say, yeah, I can see that doc. I'll agree with you, doctor. And I got my church agreeing with me that what you do will be healed. We're going to pray for you, doctor. And we do. We pray for our doctors. And we say, doctor, you have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. I don't care if the doctor's born again or not. I'm born again. And when I pray and I intercede, we have that prayer and that intercession. Amen? Praise God. We pray and we intercede one for another. And we agree with one another. But come to that point of faith that point of agreement, that point of you know it'll work, you know what you have. Get into a big bad situation, get together in a league, get together in friendships, get together with your Christians, call for prayer. Call for the ones that'll believe and tell them about where your faith is. I'm gonna get better day by day. I'm gonna get better every day. Yes, yeah, that's where you start, that's where you start. Anyway, praise God, we overcome giants. And we overcome those things that come against us in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Amen. Come to class. Come and hear the Word of God. Come and strengthen your foundation or watch it on YouTube as Steve and I are able to put it up on YouTube under Eagle's Nest Training Center. So praise the Lord. We love you guys. Have a great day in the Lord. Have a great month in the Lord and a season. But we are giant overcomers. And the foundations of our faith help and solidify that overcoming power. The foundations of who we are and how things work from Hebrews chapter 6 and the tabernacle, the foundation of Jesus seen from the Old Testament in patterns and, and things to the New Testament. And we can know and understand those patterns and understand how God works. Love you guys. Again, talk to y'all later. Amen.